just want to uh, commend our choir. And they don't have a lot of voices up there. But I do think they are exceptional. Amen? Yeah. Uh, give them a hand and let them know. Day. It really helps my job to preach Amen. much easier because the, the, the singing, uh, when, we, when we worship God, many people think we sing for you. I'm singing for me. That's why we like songs we like, you know, things of that nature. I like, you know, but really we sing to prepare our minds to hear the word of God. Um, if you go back and study the Psalms, they had, they called, they're called Psalms of Ascent. Uh, the temple sat up on the hill, and when it says a song of ascent, that's actually part of the text. And so these are songs that they sang on the way to the temple, and it prepared them to hear from God. So uh, we don't sing for your feet, Amen. even though you pat your feet. We don't sing and worship to get you happy, even though that might happen. We're singing to uh, honor God, speak of the greatness of God, the glory of God, and that prepares our hearts and minds to hear the word of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so I, I think our choir and our worship leaders, they do an exceptional job. Yeah. And I just want to acknowledge them and also put in a plug for them that you have a voice. Amen. 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 Uh, the Holy Spirit's been sort of nudging you. Amen. Uh, we need some voices up here. Especially those of you can sing baritone <laughs> and bass and a low tenor, amen. In other words, if you are a man and you can sing, we need you, amen. amen. So uh, I know it's a shameless plug. Choir director, I want my five dollars after church, amen. <laughs> All right, we are in Second Corinthians five uh, twenty, and we want to read through. Sixth chapter, second verse. Even though I'm only going to speak on 20 and uh, 21, uh, the verses that go into the next chapter, they really are all linked together. Uh, verse 20 in um, chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians through 6 chapter 4, 13 verse, it's really one paragraph in the Greek text. So we really shouldn't be reading uh, the whole thing together, but I'm just going to read down. Uh, to verse 2. So I'm going to start at 520 and uh, read through 6-1 and you can complete our congregational reading uh, by reading verse 2 back to me. And we are still talking about the believer's ministry of reconciliation. Notice the word of the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5:20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 6.1, and working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Verse 2 read. For he says, at the acceptable time, I listened to you, and on the day of salvation, I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Can God's people say amen? Amen. amen. You might have a seat. We are studying 2 Corinthians chapter 4 through chapter 7. 2 Corinthians is really one of four letters written by Paul to the church in Corinth. Church which was riddled with much doctrinal and behavioral error. And it was due to the Corinthians' past pagan lifestyle. This doctrinal and behavioral error was the reason why Paul had to write more letters to this particular church than any other on record in the New Testament. And it is for the same reason, bad doctrine and bad behavior, that he wrote the second letter to the Corinthians a letter which in actuality is the fourth letter he had written to that church. Two of them, we don't have them, they're lost. We still have first, 
2 Corinthians, really 1 Corinthians is the second letter, and first letter is the second letter, and the second letter is really the fourth letter. So there's a one and two. We really don't have, but Paul mentions those letters in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And so he wrote to this church more than any other because uh, this church had a lot of problems, and so they needed a lot of instruction from the Lord. And so the church had a lot of problems, so they needed to hear the word of the Lord often. Amen? Amen. And, and that means the church today needs to be saturated in the word of God. Amen. A whole lot of bad doctrine and a lot of bad behavior, trust me, taking place as I speak in other places. Amen. And so we need to hear the word of God. Amen. In this second Corinthian letter, Paul addressed many different issues. Many of these were doctrinal areas which Paul was greater enlightened by the Holy Spirit during a period of incarceration and severe persecution. So while he's in jail, he really has time to think about these great doctrines of the faith in God. He reveals more to him, and he enlightens his mind in a greater way. So truth Paul already knew. And so sometimes, you know, there are things that we know, but we can go deeper in what we know. And so there's greater illumination in what we know. I know some of you think you know it all, whatever you know, there's always something else to learn. Amen. This included a deeper revelation and enlightenment concerning the many false teachers who had invaded the church of Corinth. He was enlightened in regards to the eternal state of Christians, or those who were genuine followers of Christ through repentance and faith in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection from the dead. And it also included his enlightenment in the ministry of reconciliation, God has given to every believer, every child of God, every Christian, you have been given the ministry of reconciliation. The believer's ministry of reconciliation is the subject we began to explore last Sunday in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 through 19. And concerning the believer's ministry of reconciliation, we covered the following points last Sunday morning. Number one, uh, believers no longer know any human being or they no longer know Christ after the flesh. In other words, we as believers, we no longer assess humans or Christ according to our old sinful nature. A sinful nature which is separated from God. And therefore, that old sinful nature it views all things from a worldly, fleshly, secular perspective. We no longer know the world this way, and we no longer know Christ this way. And, you know, some of you, if you're really starting to grow in your faith, you'll no longer know your husband or wife this way. Amen. Teach us. Just a few amens this morning. Amen. And I thought about that last night and this morning. You know, uh, you know the reason why some of us have so many problems in our marriage because we think about our spouse as the world thinks. There's so few amen, I probably need to stop and preach the rest of the sermon. Seriously, the sermon on that right now is just quiet. I mean, we don't assess our spouse with the mind of Christ. Amen. We intend to assess our spouse and not realize you got issues too. Amen. You know, you assess your spouse as being messed up. Well, you messed up too. Amen. And I know I'm messed up. And I know I need the grace of God. And I know I need to grow. See, this is how we should view one another. Spouse, church members. Brothers, sisters, in Christ, we no longer assess humans according to our whole fleshly, sinful nature. But we assess them as an individual that has been impacted, the choir is saying, by the marvelous grace of God. God is gracious to you. Extend that, amen, as you think about someone else according to the mind of Christ. So we no longer, Paul says, we no longer assess the world nor Christ according to the flesh. And so, you know, we, are, we, we now view all things according to the truth or what really is. 
We now view Christ to be perfect God, perfect sinless man, who is one essence, who is one in essence and substance with the Father, equally sharing every attribute of God. He died for our sin, was buried, and rose again on the third day in order that those who were chosen by God before the foundation of the world, they could be saved by exercising faith in Christ and be completely redeemed from all sin forever. And so we understand unredeemed humanity as those who are dead in trespasses and sins. They cannot help themselves. And therefore, they are utterly unable to do anything for their redemption from sin. And thus, their only hope is in the salvation, which is through grace alone, by faith in Jesus Christ alone, according to the scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone. And I really probably needed to expand that. We no longer view our brothers and sisters in Christ according to the flesh. We ought to be looking upon all things with the mind of Christ. <coughs> Your husband, your wife, your children, your kids who are saved, your parents, grow up and think like a, a mature child of God. And you young folks, let me say this. It's hard to treat you as an adult when you still think like a child. Amen. Amen. At 17, 18, 19, 20. If you want you to grow up, but let me move on. Amen. We no longer assess according to the flesh. I don't know why I just feel I had to say that. Just moved by the spirit. Amen. And since I got very little response, it must have really been the spirit. Amen. Amen. Number two, because the, belief, because the believer no longer views the Christ according to the flesh or according to sinful human nature, but according to who Christ really is and according to what he truly accomplished on Calvary's cross, they are a new creature in Christ Jesus. If you began to view Christ the way he really is, and you believe on him, you become a new creature or creation in Christ Jesus. Why? Old things pass away completely, and thus they, the, the, you know, you cannot go back to living according to your old, godless, sinful nature. You may struggle with sin, but you'll never again be comfortable in the sins of old. Why? Because the Spirit of God, it has made this old stuff pass away and its error was since pass away completely. So if you are saved, you no longer should be comfortable in your sins. They are a new creature because new things have come. So in the perfect tense, and it means they come one time and they never leave you, they linger. You know, uh, believers are new creatures in Christ because they take on a desire for the things of God. That's new. You know, when you're in the world, you don't want the things of God. You know, when you're not saved, you don't want to be up in here Sunday morning. <laughs> You'd rather be home sleeping or whatever you do on Sunday morning. I don't know what people do on Sunday morning. Amen. I've been in church all the time. Amen. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what you do on Sunday morning. Amen. I, 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 when I'm not here on Sunday morning, but the rest, the rest of my week is messed up. <laughs> things become new. The desire for the things of God, they linger. They never cease. Old things pass away from the believer's life, which used to dominate him or her. This, of course, is sin. And all of these two desires we now have, Paul said they all come from God, or they all are of God. <clears throat> the same God who reconciled us unto himself, or brought us into a friendly relationship with himself through his son, Jesus Christ. Nothing we possess as believers is of our doing. It is all from God alone to his glory alone. Amen. Our salvation and redemption is began by God's doing, and it will be completed by God's doing alone. It is God alone who made the old things pass away. It is God alone who made the new things come. Everything that we have, it is not of ourselves. It is of God alone. The same God who reconciled us unto himself, and what that means is we used to be enemies of God. We have now been reconciled to God in this friendly relationship. The same God who has reconciled us unto himself through Christ alone is the same God who has given to every believer, those of us who know Christ as Savior, the ministry of reconciliation. 
In other words, we need to be sharing with unredeemed humanity the truth that when Jesus Christ was on the cross, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Yes. Not counting their trespasses against them. Not holding anything against them. Not holding any trespass against them. Not holding any error against them. Not holding any sins against them. And if you come to this God, man, Jesus, your sins are forgiven. And God holds nothing against you. See, this is the word of reconciliation God has given to those of us who have been saved. That is this. We need to share with the world or the, those who are unredeemed that when Jesus was nailed to the cross, God was actually reconciling man back unto himself. And because Jesus paid the price for our sin in totality on the cross, God no longer holds the trespass against those who have come to Jesus for there is complete forgiveness from God through Jesus Christ unto us. And so no matter where I am, no matter where you are, if you know Christ, God don't have anything against you. Amen. If you really are saved, whatever you did last night, now you need to repent and confess that sin before the Lord to maintain fellowship, but God's not holding this stuff against us. Now, Christians will, and they'll never let you forget it. But most Christians are not like Jesus. Amen. He holds nothing against you. Okay, let's move on as Paul continues to talk about this ministry of reconciliation God has given to us. Notice uh, 2 Corinthians 5.20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Once again, Paul uses the term therefore, the Greek word on. Remember, it's an adverbial uh, conjunction, and that simply means uh, it lets us know what we read in verse 20. You can't understand unless you first understand what is in verse 19. So when you understand that, you, you know that this is what it means. In view of the fact that God has given to us, every believer, the ministry of reconciliation, the ministry of sharing with those who do not know Christ the Savior, that God has reconciled the world of lost humanity to himself, he is not holding their trespasses against them, and he has committed this word of reconciliation to us. Because of all of that, we are now what? We are now ambassadors for Christ. In short, the reason why we are ambassadors for Christ is because of what we just read in verse 19. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation because we know all of that, and we have experienced it through a personal conversion and strength. Because of all of that, we are now ambassadors for Christ. Word ambassador there, very interesting words. The Greek word press bureau. It means to be a dignified delegate. It's translated in most English translation by the word ambassador. It is, it is a dignified ambassador. It is a dignified delegate or a dignified representative of another. And so an ambassador or a delegate, it is a dignified diplomatic official of the highest rank sent by one country as its long-term representative to another country. For example, in the secular political world, the United States has an ambassador to the United Nations. He or she officially and legally represents the interests of the United States in the international political community or that political business that takes place in the United Nations. They represent them officially, legally, they represent the United States. And because they represent the United States in an official capacity, there are certain expectations which are required of them in order to effectively be an ambassador for the United States. Therefore, they cannot do business in the name of the United States in the public forum by acting any kind of way. Mm -hmm. Teach us. Come on. Because the ambassador is a dignified, mm -hmm. stately, 
Now, we have a hard time understanding that because we don't have statesmen anymore. We have politicians. We don't have statesmen. We have politicians. I do something weird every night, and I know my wife thinks I'm crazy. And I finally told her why. Honestly, every night before I go to bed, I go to bed, and I put on, YouTube is great for something. So there's some good stuff out there. But every night before I go to bed, normally I go to bed and I put on this one speech by Winston Churchill. It's called his finest hour speech. Every night I put that on. So finally I told my wife, I put that on because I live in this fantasy world. <laughs> that a statesman like that would arise and just tell the truth. So statesmen are supposed to be dignified. They are supposed to have the best interest of their country or their nation in mind. Not their own comfort. Not their own pension plan. Not their own health care. Give you one, but we don't want that right. Now, let me move on. I hope y'all know they don't have to Move on, amen. Ambassadors are dignified statesmen who represent. And there's a certain behavior required of them. And so an ambassador for the United States can't do business in the public forum. And I know I'm, I'm, I'm dating myself, but this, this is all I know. They can't represent themselves in the public forum by cursing like Lil' Kim. Oh, <laughs> Or Snoop Dogg or Snoop Lion. I don't know who he is. Amen. <laughs> Whatever he is at the present time. And if you're old school, you can't, you can't, he or she can't represent. Like, remember old nasty Billy Jackson? Y'all ain't with me today. Amen. I was laughing. Now y'all are awake. Amen. They can't go up there like some fire mop rocker or rapper or RB person who has to put a parental advisory sticker Amen. on the CD. They cannot do business for the United States as its official and its, as its official representative dressed like a pimp. They can't go up in there dressed like Bishop Juan the Pimp Magic, who was supposedly Snoop Dogg's pastor. They cannot stagger into the United Nations Assembly inebriated. That means butter. That means high. That means tipsy. Or more blatantly, drunk, sloppy, and slobbering. They cannot do business in the name of the United States and be on the weed at the same time. They cannot walk into the United Nations and fall out on the floor and foam at the mouth like a mad dog, repeating the same group of words over and 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 then say, Jesus made me do that. Theoretically, they are supposed to be dignified. This means they are to be honest, truthful, persons of great integrity, sober-minded, and sober-acting. The point is, unless they behave in a certain way, they cannot be an effective ambassador for the United States. In a similar way, this is who every believer is for Christ. Every believer is an ambassador for Christ. Every child of God is a high-ranking official in the kingdom of God sent by Christ as his long-term representative to the world of unredeemed humanity. And just as an ambassador in the secular political realm must meet certain expectations to be an effective ambassador for his or her country, the same is true for all who are ambassadors for Christ, and that is you and that is I. Amen. We must all strive to walk the talk that we say we know Jesus as Savior. In order to be an effective ambassador for Christ, we cannot live like the world of unredeemed humanity. We cannot talk like the world of unredeemed humanity. We can't always go to the same place of unredeemed humanity. We cannot dress like the world of unredeemed humanity. Let me be very specific here. We cannot dress in a provocative, sensual, lewd, lascivious way. Did I cover everything in that? 
and be an effective ambassador or an effective high-ranking official in the kingdom of God officially representing Jesus Christ. In other words, we must be dignified ambassadors for Jesus. Yes. Yes. We're ambassadors for Christ. I am a pastor. I am a Bible teacher. I am a theologian. And I am an historian for Jesus. Amen. That's who God made me. Yes. And I thought about this a couple weeks ago. I, you know, I, I would stop being ashamed of women. That's who I am. So why, why, why should I be ashamed of who I am? I am a pastor. I'm a Bible teacher. And yes, I am a theologian. I am in a story. Amen. That's how God, that's, that's the gifts God gave me. Amen. That's who Amen. I am. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the only way I can be effective in the kingdom of God. Now, you know, people try to make you feel good to say that because people think you're bragging. I'm not bragging. That's who I am. Amen. Amen. But guess what? In order for me to do that effectively, there's a certain behavior that's required of me. I am Christ's ambassador, and therefore there are certain expectations I must strive to live with all that is in me in order to be effective representing Jesus in all situations and in all places. I to be first and foremost spiritually minded, Christ-centered, have a biblical worldview according to sound essential doctrine of the faith that has been delivered to God's people once and for all. I must live like this to be an effective ambassador for Christ. I must be as intelligent as I can be to represent Jesus. Amen. I must be as articulate as I can be to represent Jesus. Amen. I must be sober-minded. I must be a man of integrity and always be ready to answer any person as to why my hope is in this God man and this man God named Jesus. I must always be ready to articulate why I believe the Bible alone to be the only authority in the life of an individual believer, in the life of the church, uh, in the church, whether local or universal. I, I, I have to answer why I believe that scripture is sufficient. Yes. In other words, I must be a dignified ambassador for Jesus. Yeah. I cannot act like I'm out of my mind and thought, word, or deed in this pulpit or anywhere else and then try to blame it on the Holy Spirit and be an effective ambassador for I must be dignified Amen. because I'm representing him. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I do a lot of walking on a lot of the walking tracks and you're always passing people. And uh, I don't let anybody pass me without being polite. Hey, how are you doing? Doing fine, fantastic. Why do you do that? Because one day they might walk up in here and see me up here. And I don't want that's that's the guy who walked the tracks like a sourpuss. <laughs> That's the guy walk the track every time I see him. He looked like he's mad. He looked like he's bitter. He looked like he's ready to fight. He looks like I, I thought he was going to attack me. He was scowling so much. That's when I go to the grocery store. I act like I got some good sense. Because I am an ambassador to Jesus. And there's a certain behavior he expects out of me. And guess what he expects the same from you and you and you and you and you and you and you. Amen. In order to be an effective, dignified ambassador for Jesus Christ, you cannot do it apart from acting, speaking, and doing things in such a way that they are indicative of Jesus, who was always lucid, he always acted and talked and talked soberly. You never read one place where Jesus sounded like he was out of his mind. You don't read where Jesus went and went to the hospital and cut up. Amen. You don't read about him going to the temple causing trouble, disturbance, acting up, acting like he out of his mind, foaming at the mouth. Let me move on. Rolling on the floor. He was always dignified. And a gentleman. That's who we need to always be. 
I know there are some who do not believe what I just said, but they believe they are being spiritual by acting ugly in the name of Jesus. But the Greek Paul here uses, it really means a dignified representative, an ambassador for Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Get it together. Amen. You even need to act like an ambassador in your home. Because some of y'all leave here and you don't. You don't sound like you know Jesus, and you don't act like you know Jesus. This is every place you go, you are his ambassador. Your spouse ought to be able to see Jesus in you. Your kids ought to be able to see Jesus in you. Your young people, your parents ought to be able to see Jesus seeping out of you someplace. Because we are all his ambassador. Amen. Verse 20, Paul says, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us. He says, we beg you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. Paul says, as though we were making an appeal. An appeal is an earnest, urgent request. So as though God were making an earnest, urgent request through us. We beg you. Begging is an emotional appeal. We beg you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. This is an extremely simple verse as far as what it says. But at the same time, it is somewhat puzzling. And I say this because Paul is not speaking these words to those who know nothing about Jesus. He is not saying these words to, the only way I can explain this is the word. He's not saying these words to somebody in the bar, somebody at the club, or, you know, wherever you go to do all your singing nowadays. You know, back, back in my day, they had the disco. I don't know what they got now. The disco, the club, cabaret, well, wherever you go to do your do, amen. He's not talking to that crowd when he says, we beg you, be reconciled to God. He is speaking to the church of Corinth. He specifically says to this church, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Paul's P is even more poignant in the Greek language for it is what we call an errorless imperative. And I know some folks, they, they look at me like, hey, I got, see, see, I'm at 56, I'm finally learning to be comfortable in my own skin and in my own shoes. This is who I am. Amen. I'm a Bible teacher, not theologian. I know it's errorless second imperative, so why not say it? Okay. And then explain it, amen. What that means is it literally reads like this. Get reconciled to God once and for all and do it now. It is a commandment to some church folks to get reconciled with God once and for all. Don't wait. Do it now. If I'm reading this portion of verse 20 correctly, I believe Paul is speaking this way because... There were some within the Corinthian church. They were there. They were in the church from a geographic perspective, but they really weren't saved. In other words, when the church gathered to worship at Corinth, there were some among them or in their midst who were not saved. They did not know the Lord, but everybody thought they did. They had no genuine relationship with Jesus, who had died for them, been buried, and rose from the dead. See, we must remember this church had been invaded by false teachers. We're going to go deep now. So Y'all wake up. Teach us. Yes. Turn that air down to 62. Amen. <laughs> Read y'all out. Remember, this church had been invaded by false teachers. And some of these people in the Corinthian church that had been supposedly won to the Lord by the false teacher. A 
According to 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4, these false teachers, they had preached another Jesus to these Corinthians. And as a result, Paul says, there were some in this church who had received a different spirit than the Holy Spirit. And a gospel, which is not really the gospel at all. Go to 2 Corinthians 11, 1 through 4. Second Corinthians 11, 1 through 4. Second Corinthians 11, 1 through 4. Paul says, I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Now you have to understand, Paul is getting kind of sarcastic because the Corinthians have been listening to fools. The Paul says, so he said, let me be a fool and maybe you'll listen to me also. So he says, I wish that you were bearing with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me. Verse 2, for I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband so that to Christ I might present you as a pure or chaste virgin. But I am afraid that as, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your mind will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Look at verse 4. For, for if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, he says, you bear this beautifully. Now, the word if there, when he says, for if, it's not a hypothetical. It's what we call a first class condition fulfilled. In other words, it is an if that is true. So in the Greek language, it's an if that is really happening. It's an if that we assume is true. We would probably translate it by the word since. But since you think you're bad. In other words, there's some evidence you think you're bad. Amen. <laughs> since you think you all this and that. Well, in Greek, it was an if that meant the same thing. So what, he, what Paul is saying is these things are actually going on in this congregation. He said, for since one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you received a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel you have not accepted. Paul says there were some in this church who had received another Jesus whom they had not preached. Some in this church had received a different spirit whom Paul did not originally preach to the Corinthians. <clears throat> And they had received a different gospel that Paul never preached to them. In essence, there was some in this Corinthian church who had been deceived completely by the false teachers. And thus they had received a false Jesus whom Paul never preached. But as a result, they had been indwelt or in, in some kind of way, they had been indwelt or infected or whatever by a different spirit. Mm, wow. Teach us. And all of this added to the fact that they had received a different gospel other than the one Paul had originally preached to them. Wow. Now this is one of the deepest verses I think in the New Testament as to what happens when a false teacher preaches another Jesus other than the Jesus revealed in the New Testament. What takes place among those who are obedient to the preaching of another Jesus from the lips of a false teacher, nowadays we call them bishops. Ah. Or prophetesses. When you receive another Jesus, other than the one revealed in the Bible, you also receive a different spirit. Wow. Teach us. Teach us. Teach other than the Holy Spirit. Teach Pastor. Now, let me go deeper. When people take heed to the preaching of a false Jesus, or a Jesus who is unlike the Jesus we read about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and he is unlike the one who is explained in the epistles in the New Testament. When people receive a different Jesus, they receive a different spirit. Amen. And a different gospel. Other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. In view of this, I've often heard people justify continuing to be a member of the church where the pastor has lost his mind and is preaching another Jesus. He's preaching that Jesus is stupid. He's so dumb, he doesn't know when one of his own dies. And when he does find out that one of his children has died, he doesn't know what to do. So he sits around to see how we're going to grieve, and then he grieves the same way. 
And people say, I'm still going there because, Pastor, people are still being saved. If you are receiving another Jesus, along with that, you're going to get a different spirit. And it's not the Holy Spirit. Listen, this is why people are comfortable supporting the wolf. They've accepted another Jesus. And they got a different spirit. Amen. And that's why they stay there. Y'all ain't looking at that. Go ahead, Pastor. If you had an alpha male wolf in your house, there'd have to be something wrong with you to stay there. Amen. And to tolerate it. See, we you know, it's funny how the Bible likens false teachers under wolves. Now, I've said this before, let me say it again. You know, we see wolves on TV, and they look just like a little bigger than the German Shepherd. Mm -hmm. sure. See one in person. Mm -hmm. They're huge. They got a head like this. Their bite is two or three times more than any dog. They can take a limb off. <coughs> You know, a dog will bite you and leave marks. If he bites you, he's taking his flesh off. Uh, a, a, a male wolf can kill a thousand pound bull elk just taking a reaper's throat out. And then you ought to watch how they feed. They're ferocious. Now, if you had a wolf in your house, for you to stay there and tolerate it, there's something wrong with you. Now, when you tolerate the false teacher, the false leader, the false bishop, the false prophet, there is a reason why, and I'm telling you, this is what it is. When people receive another Jesus, they get with it a different spirit. Amen. And Paul is talking about an unclean spirit. Yes. Called demons. I don't know if they're demon possessed, but they're definitely demon influenced. You would have to be to still have a soft spot for the world. Amen. For y'all to really understand what I'm saying, go home and YouTube, Google, however you want to do it. YouTube a wolf killing his prey. Mm -hmm. And you'll understand why I say there's something wrong with anyone who still has a false spot, a soft spot for the wolf. Mm -hmm. Tell me, these people have taken on another spirit, a different spirit. And that's why they stay there. And that's why they look at you like deer caught in the headlights when you say, wait a minute, the Bible says, they look at you like, <laughs> This is why people are entertained by the false bishop or the false preacher. He's preaching another Jesus. Yes. They have received this false Jesus and they have taken them on themselves in some kind of way, another spirit, an unclean spirit. And therefore, when the pastor preaches another Jesus, instead of running for their life, they get happy and say, preach, bishop, preach, pastor. I really believe these people are under the influence of an unclean spirit. Amen. For what other reason is there for a person to consistently submit themselves to the spiritual wolf. Wow. This is why when a man is preaching another Jesus, you need to just bounce, leave, mm -hmm. run for your life. Mm -hmm. If you stay there long enough, you will be influenced yes. at the minimum Amen. by a different spirit. Yes. Paul said there's some of you, you've received another Jesus <coughs> and a different spirit. I really believe there was some in the geographic space of the Corinthian church in other words, they were there on Sunday morning when the church gathered together and they had been infected by false teachers who were preaching another Jesus, another dog. They really weren't saved. They really didn't know how to say it, but they had gotten a different spirit. And it is to these people Paul is saying, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God or get reconciled to God once and for all and do it now. Let me tell you something. I'm going to move on. You guys are trying to reason with these people sitting up in these churches where the preachers teaching false doctrine. You need to give them the gospel. Because you can't reason with the devil. Am I in the house today? Oh, yeah. You cannot 
sit down and have a talk with Satan. You cannot sit down and reason on folks who have been influenced by another spirit. They need to be reconciled Jesus. by God yes. through the precious blood of Jesus yes. who yes. died for sin, was buried, yes. and rose again, yes. and is the only one who can deliver them from whatever spirit has gotten a hold of them. Oh, yeah. You tell everybody, you look, you know, I'm, I'm not going to talk to you all day today about fishing. All I can tell you is you need to get reconciled to God, and you need to do it now. Amen. And then there is this. I really hope there are none in this church who have come to church every Sunday, but you really don't know Jesus. You've never had a serious heart-to-heart -heart talk with the Lord and told you that you were sorry for your sin and asked you to save you from your sin as you believe. Jesus died for your sins on the cross, was buried and rose from the dead. I hope there are none in here like there was in Corinth. Preach You're coming to church every Sunday, but you've never really been saved. You've never really truly had a conversion experience mm. through Jesus Christ. Mm. Make sure you are saved. Make sure you really do know Jesus as your Savior. And you're not just a church member who's in the geographic location of Word of God Community Church from Sunday to Sunday. Get along with God at home or wherever and search your heart and make sure you have been reconciled to God yeah. and Jesus Christ. Yeah. I beg you, just as Paul did, be reconciled to God once and for all yeah. and do it now. Amen? Yeah. Amen. It'd be a shame for you to sit up there all you hear the church and really not know Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 And it'd be a shame if you get up there in the Lord and you start telling all you did. I bless you in the name of the Lord. I did this, I sang, I did this, opened my Bible, did this, that. And he says, you know what? I don't even know who you are. Yeah. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I don't know. Make sure you know Jesus. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. Verse 21, I'm almost through. Paul says, uh, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Paul has to explain to church folks how God reconciled them unto himself by Jesus. Why? There's some folks in there were just not saved. They had been under the influence of false teachers. And so Paul now explains how he God reconciled sinners to himself through Christ by saying, He, God the Father, made him, God the Son, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him or in Christ. Yeah. God reconciled sinners unto himself by making his son, Jesus Christ, the one who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. God made the one who knew no sin, his son, Jesus, to be sin in our behalf. Jesus was fully God and fully man, yet he had no sin. Why? His, and, and because his human nature was always in subjection to his God nature. Jesus did not have a sin nature as we all do because God was his father. He didn't have a human father. Jesus' conception in the womb of his mother, or it was, he was conceived in the womb of his mother, a virgin named Mary. It was not through sex, human sexual intercourse, but as a result of the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary, and she came to be with yes, child. Yes. Jesus' conception came about through a supernatural act of the Spirit of God. It was through this supernatural act of the Holy Spirit that the Word was with God and was God. Jesus in the pre-incarnate state, he entered the womb of Mary. He gestated for nine months like all babies do in the womb. It is because of this, of the absence of a human father, but conceived by the Holy Spirit. So Jesus had no sin nature. Amen. And therefore he never committed one sin. Amen. He had no sin nature. He was fully human, but no sin nature. Yeah. He didn't do like us, man. He didn't take a second and third look at Boom Chica. Amen. <laughs> None of the men know what I'm talking about. Today. And then almost ran off the road driving. <laughs> Why do we come up here and want to be hypocrites? We all know we got the problem, man. And you sisters, y'all like said, y'all got the same problem, amen. Maybe not four times, but two, at least one. You might not have as bad as a man, but you look at it. You know you are. Jesus didn't have that problem because he didn't have 
a sin nature. Amen. You never thought about cursing somebody out. He didn't have a sin nature. He had no sin. Amen. The Bible says there was no gal, gal. Never, never uttered one curse word. He never had one bad thought. He never had one evil thought. See, that's, that's how much better he was, is than us. Amen. Y'all have had all kinds of thoughts since I've been up here. <laughs> I wish he'd sit down. I wish he'd hurry up. I got to get up and go to sleep. Some of you probably heard of some curse words that be under your breath. Amen. <laughs> he didn't have all that. He was sinless. Amen. But this was necessary. In order for Jesus to sacrifice himself to us, unto his Father, in our behalf. Because God can only accept that which is perfect and undefined. No other human could have sacrificed themselves in behalf of sinners, for all of us humans are born in sin, and they have a sin nature traced far back and goes back to the first man and God cannot accept a sinful substitutionary sacrifice to pay or cancel another sin debt. Me trying to pay your sin debt is like me trying to pay off your bills out of checking account that's bankrupt. <laughs> I'm telling you, I got it. I got you covered. Go down there with a the checkbook, you ain't got a dime in there. And even worse, it's closed out. It's bankrupt. Amen. And I'm trying to pay your debt off. In order for somebody to pay your sin debt off, they had to be perfect. They had to present themselves to the Father as a perfect sacrifice for your sin. Jesus was both God and a sinless man. He submitted himself to the Father, and God put all sin, including all of our sins, on him. As Jesus bore all of our sins on the cross, what happened? God laid his wrath on Jesus. He punished our sin in his son on the cross. Jesus literally became the object of God's wrath. Not for his sin because it didn't have any, but in place of us. This was literally the hell and separation of God. All of us deserve because we are of our sin. Amen. When God laid his wrath on his son to punish our sin, the wrath of God for our sin was satisfied once and for all. This is why the person who knows Christ sin will not face God for their sin as far as their salvation is concerned because their sin has already been punished as it was laid upon Jesus and God punished Jesus in our place once and for all. And he, sat, and he satisfied the Father perfectly once and for all. And because he has been punished once and for all for our sin, we are in him. We have become the righteousness of God yeah. in Christ. Yeah. Hallelujah. From God's point of view, those who are in Christ appear to him as his righteousness. Amen. Praise God. And it is because of this we are reconciled to God. Yes. We are no longer enemies of God who were dead in trespasses and sin, but we are reconciled to God. We have been made friends unto God forever. Why? Because Jesus became sin for us and humbled himself and submitted himself to the Father, and the Father spoke him Amen. for all my ugly sins. Yes. Yes. And because of that, the way I appear before God, I appear to him as the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. Three more short paragraphs, and I'm going to sit down. In spite of my struggles and my sins, yes, Dr. Kendall still struggles with sins in his life. You, you, don't, you don't have to go out in the streets to sin. You don't have to commit. You see, we got the top four or five. Adultery, fornication, cursing, drinking liquor, some other ones. You know, it's more sin in the Bible than fine. Like nasty attitude, letting the sun go down on your wrath, you hate your husband's guts. <laughs> you hate your wife guts. You don't like your sister in church. You don't like your brother in church. You wish your pastor would shut up on Sunday morning. You don't pray. You don't study. You never pray. You get in trouble. You never crack the word of God open. 
involving no ministry. <laughs> Hate your employer. You go to work and have to do your job. What's on my sin? You're unthankful. You don't thank God for anything. Sit down there, eat up all that good food, not thank for anything, complain it all the way, cut the steak. <laughs> Just so under <laughs> <laughs> Crying rib with, with you got enough nerve to have you the little uh, mint sauce on the side. <laughs> You're gonna leave here and chow down. Just so ungrateful, unthankful, just downright all of just unholy. I have some of the same struggles. I think I've constantly doubted my calling in ministry. This last week I said, Lord, have I really been called to preach? I'm just wasting my time. And I said, you know, I, I really should have done something else in my life. And I feel like, boy, I just feel like I, my, I wasted my life. I feel like at times that um, I could have did something just much better, more noble. You know, I, 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 I question my effectiveness in the pulpit. I question my effectiveness as a pastor because we don't have a mega church. Christians are making things that. I struggle with my thought life at times. But unto God, I'm reconciled. Oh, yeah. Well, unto God, I'm not his enemy, but I'm his friend. Yeah. Why? Because I am his righteousness in Christ. Yeah. The same is true of you if you know Jesus and his Savior. I must admit that intellectually I know this is true, but I struggle with this truth because I was raised in a legalistic, Arminian, Pharisee, self righteous type of holiness Pentecostal environment, which taught. God was actually looking for ways to send you to hell. And they taught even though you belong to him, by the end of the day, you might not. And therefore, you got to hold on, hold out, run, try to make 199 and a half on do. I was never taught because Jesus became sin for me. And I'm in him. I'm now the righteousness of God in Christ. In spite of my struggles with this, it is nevertheless true. And the same is true of you also. If you know Christ as your Savior, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. And I'm going to say it again. God has nothing against you. Amen. There is no barrier between you and your God. You are friends with God. You can talk with God any time of the day. Even when you mess up, tell him you messed up. Tell him what you did. And go ahead and tell him. I don't know why I did it. I just did, though. Amen. I talk to God about everything. I'm walking around. I'm talking to God. And I say, now what? Now what? You know, I went from saying amazing grace to something else came to my mind. And I just confess it to the Lord. And I ask him, Lord, what's wrong with you? He said, you're just being you. You messed up. But I'm still all right with God. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Lord Jesus. Make sure you know Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Make sure you know Him. Because when you do, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. 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 And you are completely reconciled with God. God is not angry with you. God is not out to get you. God is not out to make bad things happen to you. God is not sabotaging your life. God's not sabotaging your kids' life. We do that on our own. Amen. God is for you. He is your friend. Because you have been reconciled unto him through his son, Jesus Christ. I pray that we'll learn this, know this, submit ourselves to it, and live like we know this is true. Amen. Amen. I'm through. Amen. Let's let's pray. Let's pray. <laughs> Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that we all understand that we are ambassadors for Jesus. We are to be dignified in representing.